Okay, it looks like we are live. I was trying to get a couple different pieces of technology going at the same time, so we'll see if this works. Uh, I got a new router, got a uh, uh, some new updates, and uh, trying to mirror some screens. So I, we shall see if this works, and uh, I'll see if I can use both screens effectively to do this. Uh, looks like the comments should be enabled. Alrighty, I'm gonna give this a go. Alrighty, apologize for being a couple minutes late. Just had to reboot a couple things. I uh, hope everybody's doing well out there. And actually, before I start, just wanted a uh, moment uh, just to think about our good friends up in uh, Northern California, uh, whether it be in white country or not. Um, it's some pretty tough times already. And then to have a firestorm uh, setting off 30,000 acres of blaze, uh, or 300,000 uh, almost acres of blaze uh, in a lot of close to a lot of communities is really tough. So just gonna do a moment of silence. Uh, think about the, the folks up there. Okay, hopefully if you have some friends out there, you've reached out. Um, I'll try to reach out a little bit later uh, to some folks I know up there, some good people. But um, yeah, so uh, let's get started. Um, today I am talking to myself. It's something I usually do in private, um, but I'm going to do here in public and uh, uh, just kind of share some things that have been on my mind um, as well as some things I've been actively developing. So um, when things changed in March with the advent of COVID, we obviously had some opportunities to go back and think about some of the tools that we use and try to learn how to use some new tools as well. And uh, uh, that being the case, if anybody is watching right now and is able to check in the comments to make sure that I've set this up accurately. Please just give me a little yay or nay uh, if you can hear me okay. I'll try to pick it up on multiple devices, but it looks like the video is going, so hopefully the audio is going as well. So one of the things that, uh, one of the tools that uh, was obviously something that could be thought about during these times of less travel was to take a step back and think about doing a presentation that really speaks to what Italian wines are and why they're so exciting. And uh, I know that in previous conversations that I've had uh, on here, um, you've heard me talk about why uh, I do this, is why it keeps me connected to Italy. I work with a great group of people. I meet a lot of people, which is why this uh, series of interviews and presentations online started, just to kind of recognize some of the great folks I've met in the wine business and uh, to further uh, their education, my education, everybody else's education, seemed like it could be useful and uh, a good way to connect with people digitally in this time where uh, it's a little bit harder to connect with folks. And so um, one of the conversations that I've had frequently is one is that uh, sometimes people tend to enjoy the presentations that I do and they see that I'm obviously passionate about it, I'm interested, I love transmitting the knowledge, it's one of the, the most fun things that I have to do in this uh, part of my career because uh, once again, it keeps me connected to Italy, but there's so much to tell. And uh, sometimes it seems a little overwhelming when I talk to folks. So I've been doing this for 15 years and sometimes one of the responses I get back in, in, in general from folks thinking about going into Italian wine studies or they just like wine and wanna know more about it. And they get faced with the incredible complexity that Italian wines have to offer and uh, sometimes get a little uh, spooked and uh, overwhelmed. And um, I think that's not the correct way to think about Italian wine. So this presentation was born out of that, out of a conversation I had with Kirk Peterson, who was doing some great stuff online with education on TV as well. And um, and it, it's some the Italian wines, there's a lot to know, but you don't need to know it all in the particulars. Sure, if you wanna pass a test, uh, it's, it's good to know uh, how to do so and to ha memorize all the, the things you need to memorize for that exam. But moving forward, is that is the minutiae really that important or the why behind it? And uh, I've always been attracted to the why, whether it be about Italian wines, well, whether it's about psychology, the why uh, side of things has always been one of the more exciting things for me. And so this presentation is about why Italian wines are so incredible to study. And uh, the opening premise is that Italian wines, or Italy is the number one country in the world for wine. I'm gonna check the comments here on my second screen. I don't see any comments, so apparently everybody must be agreeing with me. Um, let me check here, nope, no, no, no disagreements. Okay, great, well that was easy. I guess the presentation's over. Everybody kind of just agrees that Italy is the number one country. 
I mean, yeah, they have great wines other places too, uh, in France, Spain, Portugal, here in the United States, whether it be in California or Virginia or Texas or South America has plenty of great wines. Uh, in South Africa, New Zealand, all over the world, um, there's some great wines. But I'm going to try to make the point now uh, that Italy is the number one. And so let's see if uh, I can share the screen here effectively. It's a little slower on the second screen going over. Come on, pointer. You can do it, little pointer. Oh, great. Looks like my mom said everything is great. And if she, she is OK with it, then we are on the money. So here is the uh, presentation. Boom. Let's see if this works. You want to record this computer screen. OK. Let's not. And where's the presentation? Let's go to application window. Maybe that'll help. Perfect. StreamYard keynote presentation. All righty. So here we go. Let's share it. A little slower on my second monitor. I apologize. And we should be getting in the screen now the presentation. If we do that, it should come up on the screen. Let me check on my version here. Nope. Still not up. Odd. Boop. Share screen. Share screen. Worst comes to worst, I'll just close the second monitor here, and I will disappear from view just so that we can get the presentation up. This is why we do trial runs. And when I did the trial run, it worked well. Hmm. OK. I'm going to close my second screen here. And uh, I will disappear from view. And we will talk over on here. And this should work a little bit better. I tried doing this before. It worked great. I'm not seeing the presentation. Chrome has lost the permission to capture your screen. Follow these steps. Great. That didn't happen in the trial run. Screen preferences. Let's turn off that screen. Boom. So now it should work. Follow these steps. OK. Ah, the privacy setting, of course. That didn't happen before. It's nothing like watching somebody fumble with this live. It's the most exciting thing in the world. System preferences, security. And I apologize for uh, having you watch me this live. Unfortunately, there's no way for me to stop doing the uh, presentation and start it up again. So this is going to be under system preferences, security and privacy. That's where I was and privacy. And then I will go to screen recording down here. There is the screen recording button. Ah, crew. Putting myself up there. Hello again. You should be able to hear me and see me. And now I am going to share the screen again now that Chrome has been allowed access, which it did before. And there we go. All righty. Let's see what it looks like on my device. I don't know how behind that is. So, and I can't see the. Oh, there we go. All righty. Good thing for lag time. All righty. So, when making the point that Italy is the number one country in the world, you want to make sure your technology works. All righty. 
So I cannot currently see comments uh, in real time, so I apologize. But let's see if the presentation works at least. Excellent. All righty. So I made the point that Italy is the number one wine country. So what basis do I have to make that claim? Well, for those of you that don't know, Italy has the most grapes, the most native grapes in the world, has the most wines in the world, has the biggest production, and here in the United States, where I'm currently, it is the biggest import category country in the world to the United States. And we also have some of the best and most unique wines in the world in Italy. So I'm going to back all those claims up and see if you agree with me. And before I do, I, I mentioned this before, but one of the things to remember about Italian wines is that the richness comes in the complexity. Don't get bogged down in how complicated Italian wines are because it's not necessarily complicated. That's not the correct word to think about when you think about Italian wines. What Italian wines have as a system, as a country, is complexity. And what that means is there's actually an underlying order that makes sense. So that the more you study, the more you understand, the more you're rewarded with information that can be shared across a category. So the counterexample here is there are some phenomenal wines made in California, but while some wineries that are next door to each other will share a similar terroir, if there isn't a very specific set of laws and, and policies in a disciplinare rule set that dictate how you should do things, you really have to forge a personal relationship with a winery. Because just enjoying one wine doesn't necessarily mean you'll enjoy the neighborhood wine. In contrast, when you study about Italian wines, since they all have to play at the highest level within this haiku structure to get beauty, once you've tried one, there's a very good chance you'll like something from a neighborhood winery. So that is the complexity. That's the point of the system of Italian wines. And so you don't necessarily need to know all the minutia, but that minutia, the baseline, is so important to be able to really truly understand the wines. So let's go into that a little bit. So I mentioned that Italy has the most native grapes in the world. And there's some great textbooks out there. Uh, one of my favorites is by Indagata, um, Native Grapes of Italy, and then the second book, uh, The Terroir. But if you look at the global scale, the global world uh, of wine production, there are 1,368, give or take, uh, a grape vine varieties, grape varieties in the world for commercial wine production. There's plenty more. Uh, maybe somebody has a grape and they make a couple bottles out of it, but that's not a commercial wine production. But as far as if you look at the global marketplace for wine, those are the really the total amount of different grape types there are in the world. Of that 1,368, Italy has 377 native grapes to Italy, autochthonous, unique. They are from Italy. And that's a low ball number. Those are just uh, the wine, the grapes that are the varietals that are listed with the Italian government. Uh, sorry, the varieties of grape that are listed with the Italian government for commercial wine production. Some people estimate that there's probably at least 500, if not more, 1,000, 2,000, that people are actually actively making wines from these grapes or using them in a blend uh, for commercial purposes. But it's just really hard to capture them all because sometimes some of the production quantities are so small. So let's say at least 377 native grapes of Italy. To put that into a bit of perspective, that is 28% of the world's production of different grapes. One small country, Italy, it's a very small country, and we'll look at that, does 28%, almost 30%, almost one third of the entire world's production of different types of grapes is home to Italy. To put it in perspective, Italy has as many different native autochthonous grapes as France, Spain, and Greece combined. Those are three other powerhouse wine countries that all make phenomenal wines. And they all have a variety of autochthonous native grapes. But all of them com together, complexly, approach Italy's quantity. And in case you were curious with these words that I'm using, native grapes is the same as autochthonous or indigenous. These are grapes that are from certain countries. You can trace back their history. And this is the earliest uh, example that we have of these different grapes. 
whether it be like Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, or more Italian grapes uh, like Cortese or Nebbiolo or Sangiovese and so many more, 377, for example. So I mentioned that Italy has the most grapes and that's cool, at least, at the very least, that's, that's, that's fun. But what does that mean? Like just because we have so many different grapes, is that indicative of quality? Well, we can also talk about the diversity of wines that Italy has. Just in, if you aren't familiar with this system, I'll talk about it in a moment, but if you are familiar, there are now 75 DOCG wines. These are wines at the very highest, most restrictive level of production of Italian wines. There's 75 of those. That's at the top of the food pyramid. There's 333 DOC wines, as far as the latest registry that I found, 118 IGTs, but that's also a little bit of a fluid number. And that doesn't even count all the table wines that are out there that are not at the highest levels of classification of Italy. So we're looking at over 500 unique wines in Italy. If you look at the amount of grapes that are planted in Italy, not even talking about the fact that a lot of vineyards are, spaces are destroyed, taken away, just because Italy has so much that sometimes, ever since Roman days, there's been the response to pull back some grape production, because it's so easy. There's, it's so easy to do great grapes and great wine in Italy that to make sure there isn't a glut of wine in the marketplace that only the best is made. So in terms of pure acreage, Italy is the fourth biggest producing country in the world of grapes. That being said, it should be noted that most of the grapes, almost the entirety of all the grapes for uh, of the genetic species that are made into wine are made into wine. A lot of grapes, and I apologize, so of all the grapes that are made, Almost all of them, a good amount of them, are made for wine. If you look at some of the other bigger producers, if you look at, say, China, the fifth biggest producer, uh, actually, the, there's moved up uh, quite a bit, actually, since then. So I think it's actually in the top two or top three as far as just raw grape production. A lot of the grapes produced in China are produced for table grapes. A growing trend uh, for wine production. In fact, China may even be the oldest wine producing country in the world. If we look back to 5000 uh, BC, there is evidence of grape based spirit, uh, distilled, uh, not distilled, but fermented uh, beverage production. So China may be one of the oldest, if not the oldest uh, wine producing region of the world or what we now interpret as what they were making as wine. If you look at Spain, uh, lots of phenomenal wines made in Spain a lot of the grapes are sold off to other countries uh, where the level of alcohol doesn't allow, um, well, the level of sugar in the grapes doesn't allow for a level of alcohol that is desired in the final wine. If you look at France, there's a big distillation um, business in some of the grapes in France. So with all that being said, Italy is still the fourth biggest producer of grapes in the world. And as far as grapes for wine, definitely in the top three. If you look at worldwide production of wine itself, it's usually a contest between Italy, France, and Spain, but Italy, uh, more often than not, is the number one producing country for wine in the world. And if you look at the United States, uh, or as far as countries that export, Italy is usually the number one exporter. And here in the United States, almost every year, Italy is the number one biggest import by volume for another country's wines, which is why the... Uh, idea of tariffs is such a scary one for us in the business here and why it would have such a big uh, oversized impact in the United States market because there are so many people employed by the Italian wine business here in the United States, which was uh, some of the claims that were suggested to uh, the administration to maybe think about not being as useful of a tactic uh, in an international global uh, conversation about tariffs. And we can also say that Italy makes some of the best, the most unique wines in the world. And I apologize, the next slide is not complete, um, but I'll see if uh, I'll read from a list instead uh, that I had prepared. But just to give an example, if you talk to any psalm, if you talk to any wine lover that's had an experience with wines from different parts of the world, if you talk about education, if you look at competitive lists, top 100 wines of the world, top best value, top most exciting wines in the world, Italian wines are always going to be overrepresented because of the quality, because of the style of wines, the diversity of styles. Uh, so for example, uh, some of the producers that we work with, 
So obviously, I work um, predominantly with Batasiolo. So if you think about the crew, Barolo uh, from Batasiolo. If you think about um, Francia Corta, like Bella Vista's Francia Corta Riserva. If you think about uh, a winery in, in Lazio that we work with, Casal del Giglio, the Mater Matuta. If you think about uh, Brunello, uh, Casanova di Neri, the Brunello uh, Tenuta Nuova. If you think about uh, Cecchi, uh, the Coevo, uh, brilliant uh, uh, wine that m brings together uh, different parts of Toscana. If you think about uh, Duca Guarini, uh, 900 years of history of making wines with an, uh, a series of wines that reflect that. If you think about uh, for Fantinelle, uh, the one and only uh, Prosecco or the Venco, uh, one of their top red wines. If you think about uh, Masi, their uh, Campolongo di Torbe, the Amarone. Uh, if you think about uh, Farnese, uh, the Cinque Autoctoni. If you think about um, Planeta, the Chardonnay that made them, put them on the map immediately their first year of production or some of their reds like their Nero d'Avola, uh, Santa Cecilia. If you think about uh, some ancestral Lambruscos that we work with, uh, with uh, different uh, with with Rigi. There's so many different beautiful wines uh, that are representative on a world stage that really uh, can bring the conversation to another level that we have with Italian wines. So let's put some things in perspective a little bit. I mentioned that Italy is a fairly small country and yet has an outsized space in the world of wine. So I thought this was kind of fun. Uh, this is kind of a comparison sake between Italy and California, for example where I live now and where uh, I'm from. So I was, I'm from Italy originally, which is obviously why I'm so excited about Italian wines. So Italy is uh, a little over 100,000 square miles. I should probably put that in kilometers. Uh, compared to California, which is 160,000 square miles. So California is quite a bit larger. It's actually 40% uh, larger than Italy. And yet, uh, the population is a bit bigger in Italy, as you would expect, for one country versus a state. So 60 million people in Italy compared to 40 million people in California. So you'd expect maybe the production of wine would be much bigger in California since it's so much larger and there's quite a few people there. But if you look at the vineyard areas, Italy has almost 40% more vineyard area than California because in Italy, we make wine everywhere. Whereas in California, it's very restricted to some certain areas, uh, especially as you go far up north, uh, as you work your way east, if you're not in the mountains, sometimes it can be quite a bit warmer. But anywhere from San Diego up to the North Coast, uh, close to the, with Oregon, there's quite a bit of production, but nowhere near how much is made in Italy. In fact, if you look at how many bottles of wine, how much wine is produced, Italy has almost 50% more production than California. And of course, if we look at wine consumption, the culture is a little bit more oriented towards wine, where we have an average uh, per capita consumption of 45 bottles a year per Italian compared to 0.2. Uh, in California. So that definitely speaks to the difference in cultures uh, in the two regions. And as far as native grapes, uh, Italy, like I said, has 377 or more native grapes. Whereas uh, I did some light research and I really could only find one. Uh, and I'm sure I'll be hopefully corrected by any Psalms that might be watching now or later. Um, but it's actually called a California, California, is that, if that's accurate. Uh, so Italy has quite a few more autochthonous grapes uh, than, uh, than in California. Not to say that one is better than another, of course. It's just to put things in perspective a little bit. So why does Italy have 377, 500, 2000? Why does Italy have so many native grapes? And you really have to break it down, or you know, if you are interested in this kind of stuff, you would break it down into history, geology, climate, and culture. And you can do more than that, but these are, I think, four of the pillars which explain why Italy has so many different grapes and why it's so exciting. And, you know, when I talk to people about this, sometimes they get overwhelmed by such a large number, you know, 377 different grapes, 500 different wines. Like that's why, why should I start even studying this? How can you possibly know? And to be honest, most Italians, my, most Italian wine psalms may not be fully conversant in every different wine of Italy, but I don't think that's the right way to approach it. You know, when you go to an Italian restaurant and you see how many different types of pasta they have, you don't go, oh, woe is me. How am I going to choose what pasta? Or if you go to a cheese shop and you go like, oh, my goodness, there's such a beautiful selection of cheeses. You can go with Fontina. You can go with mozzarella. Uh, just today I had some mozzarella. I had some pecorino. I had some um, 
something similar to, to Gruvier. Uh, there's so many different beautiful cheeses from Italy. It's not like you get overwhelmed, hopefully. You go, hmm, I really like that cheese, or ooh, I really like Piave Stravecchio. You get excited about it. Same thing with all the different vegetables and fruits of Italy. I mean, Italy has one third of all of the fauna of Europe and uh, quite a bit of the flora. In fact, if you think about some of the unique, you know, citrus fruits from Sicily or the artichokes from Rome, or if you think about some of the olive trees that make some of the beautiful olive oils from Liguria and Toscana and Puglia, you don't get overwhelmed, hopefully, you get excited. Or the different cuts of meat, like uh, that people argue in Italy, is prosciutto from San Daniele, more exciting than prosciutto from Parma. Obviously, I can hear my colleague in uh, the office uh, from Emilia Romagna saying, obviously, it's prosciutto di Parma. But there's so many different cold cuts and different things in Italy that are exciting. So the same thing with wine. And that's the way I like to think about Italian wines. You have such a buffet, such a, a beautiful diversity, complexity, rich complexity in Italy that you can't find anywhere else. And that is why, that's specifically why um, Italy should be so exciting to study as far as wines. So let's look at history a little bit. I'll keep it brief because I know some people love history and some people may skip this slide. So. If we look back uh, 4,000 BC, some of the first, uh, just lately, we found some remains, not we, but there were some uh, findings uh, in some caves in Sicily about some uh, containers that were used for wine production. So obviously the history of making wine in Italy is very, very long. In fact, when the Greeks came to Italy, they used the nickname Onotria or the land of vines because there was already quite a bit of wine production and, and grape vine uh, production in Italy that was very alive and growing and they were amazed by how many different types there were and how well it took in different parts of the peninsula of Italy. There was been some comparisons, I'll put in just another date in there, 536 AD, there were some comparisons to the this year, 2020, to potentially being a runner-up for one of the worst years in the world and uh, some people clap back with 536 being the worst year in the world with uh, Volcanoes erupting, trade collapsing, bubonic plague, empires collapsing, populations being decimated. So 536 was a terrible year. Unfortunately, there's still four months left to this year. So hopefully uh, 536 will still be the reigning champion for the worst year in recent human history. But uh, that's just another date to put in there. If you think about the Middle Ages, the 1000s, uh, starting of the 1000s, sacramental wines were necessary to keep wines going in Europe. Some of the oldest producing areas and companies in Europe are monasteries and abbacies that maintain the tradition of making wine, also because there's less chance you would die from it than drinking water with bacteria in it, very important. But also here in California, you think about how prohibition stopped the production of alcohol, except for holy wine, which maintained the tradition for the number of years that wine couldn't otherwise be done. So we wouldn't lose some of the knowledge and the custom of wine. And then we move to another date that a lot of people don't think about. They think about this fairly small peninsula, which is Italy, and Italy to them is a monolith. But if you've ever traveled to Italy or if you know Italians, you know that certain parts of Italy have different preferences. You go to Northern Italy, and, um, and we'll talk about the climate as well, has influences, but you see more butter. You go to Southern Italy, you see more olive oil and tomatoes. You go to certain parts of Italy and there's a very hands-on, um, reaching out, broad uh, familiarity with new people, whereas other places of Italy are a little bit more traditionally quiet. And this is because Italy has only been a country, or one of the reasons, Italy has only been a country since 1861. It's a fairly young country. It's younger than the United States. And what does this mean? It means that before then, Different parts of Italy were different kingdoms, the kingdom of the two Sicilies, the kingdom of Sardinia, the papal states, the city-states before that of Pisa, of uh, Venice, of Milano, of Firenze, that had their own militaries, their own money, their own customs, their own food and wine. And so it wasn't until 1861 that there was this unification of Italy. And so all these different wine uh, preferences as well in productions were joined together. So that's one of the reasons there's so many complexities in Italy. And it wasn't until the 1960s that we actually codified it into a DOC, DOCG system on 
how Italian wine should be thought about. And it followed the French system of village control, of looking at what are the great foods or and or including wine that are specific and historical and typical and better in their own way than other areas. And so we're going to make a wine from here, this small little area, as opposed to a larger area. The geology in Italy is some of the most complex in the world, and especially, and I would put is the number one most complex geology in the world because of the temporal range that we have in Italy. So if you look at this map of Italy, all the different subtypes of soil that you have, um, specific also to winemaking and have an influence on winemaking, and we're active in Italy on some of the oldest viticultural land masses that are available, talking about millions of years old, you know, whether it be in parts of Barolo that are 16 million years of old, or in uh, Sardinia that are even older in other parts of Italy, and yet we're Italians. And so we still make wine on active volcanoes. So on Etna and Vesuvius, there are some lovely wines being made as well. So there's no other country in the world that can be working on soils that are quite as old or as new, because as Italians, you know, phylloxera and mold are pedestrian problems when you have to deal with lava. But that's what keeps it exciting. I mean, you think about the innovation that has happened on the peninsula of Italy, whether we go from the Pantheon in the Roman era to Brunelleschi's dome, there's always room to do something new and different in Italy and always how to reinvent yourself and do things differently, which also lends itself to why there's so many different native grapes in Italy. And of course, the climate's an easy one as well. For those of you that know, if you go in the north, it's capped by the Alps, very high mountains, cool temperatures, has a big effect as far as the acidity and the maturation of the grapes. If you work your way south, typically in the west, you tend to get warmer temperatures, which changes the grapes and how they thrive in different environments, and so therefore which grapes are successful in different areas. Something also to note, I mentioned um, Etna, you'll see a little bright dot on the uh, right side of uh, Sicily, Sicilia, and that is uh, Mount Etna. And another thing to, to remember is that not only is it an active volcano, but it's very high. It is 4,000 uh, feet, I believe. Oh, sorry, 4,000 meters. And so active wine growing is done at a very high level, at a very different temperature and soil type than in just the surrounding land around the volcano. So some of the things to think about. Also, um, there are some theories, uh, including by Oscar Farinetti, uh, Nel Blu, talking about how the uniqueness of the wind patterns of Italy, because it's a peninsula that's bounded, obviously, by these seas, because of the mountains, because of where Italy is located um, on the globe, and the way the patterns of winds change throughout the peninsula of Italy have a huge effect on the diversity of grapes and every other agricultural product. So you have this beautiful diversity and richness of diversity because of that as well. So there you have it. That's the some of the many reasons that Italy has this beautiful diversity. And sometimes the easiest way to see that is just looking at the landscape. So the big picture on the left on your screen, uh, if this isn't mirrored, I don't believe it is. Let me check my third screen. Uh, hasn't gotten there yet, so we'll see if that loads. But it, the biggest picture with the mountains in the background, that is uh, some vineyards in Barolo that on a very clear day, you can see the Alps uh, in the background and uh, the Alpinino on the other side. In the top right corner, uh, that is the flat plains of Salento. Yep, the image loaded, looks like it's correct. Uh, on the top right there, you'll see the, the sandy soils uh, and underneath the uh, quaternary soils, the uh, calcium and... Um, Iron, uh, let's see, calcium and I'm blanking um, that are underneath the soils there that make some of the beautiful primitivos and malvasias and negromaros of the area that are well suited to that soil and temperature. In the bottom right there, that is a, a good example of galestra soils that are unique to Chianti. And you can go on and on and just, just visually take in how different each part of Italy does. I mean, at some point, you know, you, in those mountains, not these mountains, but if you go a little bit more to the north, people will actually uh, use terracing to do grapes and they'll harvest by, by rope or by helicopter. So obviously a different soil type uh, and in different parts of Italy. So really it helps 
couch certain grapes to make them comfortable and express themselves in the best way. And since Italy has such a big palette of grapes, and we have so many different temperatures and climates and soil types and altitudes, that there's a grape for anywhere in Italy. And of course, the culture. So in Italy, wine is treated at a very basic level much more differently than here in the United States. In the US, when I talk to somebody about wine, it is an insular experience for them. Sometimes they think about the pairing, but usually they taste the wine and that is a good way for somebody to understand the wine. Now, from an organoleptic perspective, if you really want to do a senses uh, breakdown tasting of the wine, that is absolutely true. But that's not what wine is for. Wine is meant to be, or at least for Italians, part of the meal. It's fairly infrequent to be somewhere in Italy and see somebody just enjoying a glass of wine somewhere. That's not a psalm. And usually psalms don't, we don't usually think of psalms necessarily enjoying wines out in the wild. If they're just having a glass of wine, great. But oftentimes they will also think about what it's going to be, what, how it's going to fit in to their day and their plate if they're as opposed to doing just a, 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 a specific tasting. But if you're going to go out in Italy and you see somebody enjoying a glass of wine, it's usually not in a bubble. It's usually with food. And so it's not just this beverage. It's not this product that's on a pedestal and away from everything else. It needs to be cohesive. And so there's this long tradition of a variety of different recipes in Italy and rich recipes in each region of Italy that really go together well with the wines from those regions as well, because they both grew up assisting each other. So in this area, this grape has certain qualities to it. And these dishes evolve to match the grape to then a different dish is done to better match the wine. And so you have this pairing in a very true sense between the food and the wine in Italy, which then translates to an experience, a dining experience. And the way I talk about this is sometimes when I, I talk to folks that are familiar with Mexican cuisine, you know, it's very unusual, perhaps in, in many parts of Mexico, to start eating your meal if it's presented at the table if your different salsas hadn't gotten to the table. For me, and the same thing uh, for eating in a restaurant, if the food gets there and the wine's not there, it makes me a little frustrated because <laughs> I want to enjoy everything together. I want everything to be a whole experience. And some examples uh, that I was thinking of, and please, if you have some examples of yourself, um, please let me know. But uh, Barolo with some roast game with truffles, amazing. Chianti Classico, Reserva with a Fiorentina steak, a thick steak. Oh, that's, that's awesome. Cerasuoli di Vittoria from Sicily with some lightly seared tuna that was fished nearby. Oh, amazing. Lambrusco with prosciutto di Parma. That just really, that, that I mean, if you're going to do it in Italy, it has very little amabile. It's very sickle. That just, that level of acidity that you get some of the Lambruscos that pair with the fattiness of the, the ham. Oh, amazing. Especially when you do it with a little uh, gnocco fritto. Amazing. If you go to Friuli in the northeast of Italy and you do a risotto con scampi, risotto with shrimp or the, the typical shrimp from the area, which are very tiny, especially near Venice, you do that with some frulano, aromatic frulano. Oh, it just couches those shrimps so well. If you think about amarone, big, bold, beautiful, aromatic amarone with a risotto alla gorgonzola, especially if it's a risotto uh, a gorgonzola that's a little bit more Lomb uh, towards Lombardia as opposed to one from Piemonte. Oh, that's great. Or even going to southern Sicily, primitivo, uh, especially primitivo that's not overly extracted, done with some melanzane that are um, from the area uh, with tomatoes, uh, amazing. Al forno, forget about it. Those are the experiences that really make sense to why Italian wines work so well in these dining experiences. There's this tradition, this culture. Okay. So the beginning of this presentation was why are exciting? Why is Italy so exciting? And my answer to you is I would suggest the complexity, the richness of complexity that Italy has, the amazing palette of different wines and the foods that go with them and hand in hand with them, which means that you'll never get bored in Italy. You may find some wines more intriguing. You may find some wines less intriguing but you have over 500 different wines to play with. So you are 
pretty close to guaranteed to finding some wines that you'll love because there are so many different styles. It's not just that Italian wines are rustic or high acid or high tannin. There are reasons why some wines are, but there's plenty of other wines that will suit your palate because of the complexity, the opportunities that Italian wines afford. So of course, with that complexity comes a need to manage that complexity. So it's not just chaos. And I didn't really talk about it, um, but when I had the two different pictures uh, before, when I talked about complexity, one was Romanesco uh, broccoli, which I love because it's basically fractal. So the more you look into uh, Romanesco cauliflower or, or, or uh, broccoli, you see these spiral patterns that keep on going down and down to infinite as far as they can in a cellular structure compared to this great jigsaw puzzle that I found uh, of amongst the, the stream where it was, a I think, a 10,000 piece puzzle set, which just trying to imagine how you would put together that puzzle is a little overwhelming to me. So that would be the extreme, the chaos, the, the complicatedness compared to the complexity of, of nature that has rules behind it. And these are the rules. So Italy has four different layers, really, uh, to classify their wines, based again on typicity and of sight and style. So what is the best expression of one grape or a connected set of grapes that really makes sense to a very small or a, a larger area? And the smaller you get and the more rules you have is where you get to the highest level on this pyramid. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they're the best wines. It's just that they're the most protected wines, so that once you've had one, there's a greater confidence that you will appreciate a similar wine, another wine by somebody else or the same producer, because the basics are all there. The rules are all there, so that once you have appreciated those, there's a better chance that you'll fall in love with somebody else's in the same neighborhood. So what are the four layers? You start with vino di tavola, table wine. Does it tell you much about the wine? No. You hope it's made in Italy. Maybe it'll give you some information about the grapes, the vintage, the general area of Italy. Not necessarily one region. It's a catch-all. Some very good wines are made at Vino di Tavola. If you've told stories about how you had this beautiful three euro glass of wine in the countryside of Italy, it, there's a good chance it was a Vino di Tavola. Can be a fine wine. You just don't know much about it. You go up a layer to EGT, Indicazione Geografica Tipica. It's actually a, an addition to the system created in the 1960s. Uh, in the 1980s, this was added. Uh, and my joke that I usually tell is that a very famous Italian, uh, Roberto Parker, uh, decided that there were certain wines that did not fit the rules of DOC and DOCG, and therefore uh, were getting, the short, they were getting uh, the short stick. They were just being classified as table wine, and it just didn't sound very good. So there is this added layer for some of the super wines, the super Tuscans, the super uh, Frulani, the super, there's no, there's no IGT in Piemonte, but just wines that operate outside of this fairly rigid structure that allow individual producers to come up with individual wines. And now you approach more the, the new world aspect of winemaking where there's more of a confidence in specific producers as opposed to specific regions and styles. Obviously, the higher up we go on the triangle here, the more um, restrictive we get. So we get di origine controllata, and we get di origine controllata e garantita. So at the DOC level, now we're talking about fairly finite, bounded, mapped uh, regions, sub-regions, appellations, within different regions of Italy. Rarely does it cross over, but there are cases where a very specific grape or certain amounts of grapes and some other basics, like maybe the minimum alcohol, the uh, aging, and some other basic things are required to be able to make this wine. So you know more once you've had this certain type of wine, what another wine is gonna be like. There's still quite a, room, a bit of room for flexibility, but at least the terroir, the style, the sensibility are gonna match. At the very top of this system, the di origine controllata garantita, now there are pages worth of rules you have to follow so that you could even put the word of that wine on the label. So for example, I usually go to uh, Barolo for examples. 
to make a wine like Barolo, you have to use a specific grape in a very specific area. The vineyards have to be between certain altitudes. They have to face a certain direction. Has to be done by hand. Has to be in a certain grade. It can't be done on the valley floor. It has to be done at a certain minimum of aging, a certain minimum of alcohol. It has to be done from a certain density of vineyards. The soil types have to be approved and on and on and on. So what you're getting when you see a wine that says Barolo is a winery that has followed a lot of specific requirements, minimums, so that you know there's a guarantee, garantita, of style and quality to the wine. So it isn't de facto that the wine's gonna be better than a DOC, but there's a lot of things weighing on it to make sure that it's very high quality. And if you have any questions, please let me know. We got a couple of uh, folks uh, saying hello. So nice nice seeing you, uh, Kenneth, and my mom's always watching, which is awesome. Uh, uh, Giovanni uh, de, de Mexico, uh, Franco, bello vederti. Uh, uh, Giovanni de Castillo, Marisa from Vegas. Uh, cool. So I'm glad hopefully some of this information is, is useful. So uh, this slide I still need to work on a little bit in how to read an Italian wine label. Um, and this bottle shot here is missing some elements as well. So I'll, I'll do that at, at a later point. But there are certain things that are required to be on an Italian wine label. And there are certain words that you'll find. And so the next slide will go over some of the other words that will be useful to know when looking at a wine label in Italy. Before I do that, obviously, uh, here's a really good example, another slide, a really good example of the most complex region of Italy, uh, which is Piemonte, as far as number of DOCGs and sub areas. And so this is actually a abridged version of the DOCs and DOCGs of Piemonte, which I mentioned as a side note, does not have an EGT, Indicazione Geografica Tipica. Um, so wines like some of Gaia's wines at the very expensive, a uh, high level wines are, are declassified to table wines because that producer, that family of producers, actually there's a, a whole family's involved, um, has elected that there are certain things they want to do a little bit differently than what the disciplinare for certain areas requires. And so they're going to make their own wines, but there is no IGT in Italy, which is fine. That's just some of the things you have to keep in mind from a commercial aspect, less from a production aspect. So as you can see, how many different DOCGs Piemonte has? Uh, 17 at last count, if I'm not incorrect. And all the black boxes are some of the DOCs um, in Piemonte. And we're actually missing some of the DOCGs here. But you can see how in different parts of Piemonte, it's not just one part of the region that has the richness of all of the DOCGs. But you see a lot of them clustered in the Lange, um, which is historically where a lot of the most historical wines are of Italy. Not the oldest, or of Piemonte, not the oldest, but there's this tradition uh, in this part uh, of Italy, of Piemonte. So other words that you uh, would be good to know uh, to translate into and what they mean from a label. So there is a word sometimes you'll find which is superiore, which in the United States you think it just means superior and really literally all we're talking about is alcohol. So in some parts of Italy it's fairly cool, it's very hard and to get to a higher level of alcohol and it's not necessarily that we're booze hounds in Italy that we're trying to get this minimum of alcohol. It's just that to make a balanced wine of a certain age worthiness, the balance is really important. And usually when we talk about balance, we talk about the acidity, the tannins, and the alcohol. Other things as well, but those are the three of the biggest pillars. And so if you don't get to a level of alcohol, it's very difficult to consider that wine to be world class. And so in a notch in certain areas is to put superiore because not only have you met the bare minimum, but you've also gone beyond that and been able to create a wine that has more balance because it has more alcohol. And that of course makes sense for certain wines and not others. Doesn't necessarily mean it's better, just means it has more alcohol, which is an indicator of quality, not that it's more quality driven. And I apologize, there's a question here. Uh, what wine would you pair with a prosciutto wrapped cantaloupe? Uh, what a great uh, Italian, uh, dish, especially to have now uh, in this warm weather. Uh, that's a fun one. I'd probably go uh, with a white. Uh, so that's something that you encounter in different parts of Italy. But when I was in Rome, I'd probably go with some white uh, Lazio wines, like uh, if you can find it, Bellone, 
um, or just some fun uh, aromatic whites to go with that melon. But at the same time, that has the acidity to cut through that beautiful fat, which is what gives the flavor uh, to prosciutto. Uh, that's a great question. If you have if some other few people have some uh, recommendations for prosciutto e melone, uh, please let me know. But some vermentino or, or something a little bit aromatic with some acidity, I think would be uh, a lot of fun. Hey, hey, Mark and uh, Lauren from Austin, Texas, uh, near wine country in Texas. Hopefully you visited some uh, uh, wineries out there. And uh, hey, Richard, how you doing, man? Uh, from Northern California. Hope you're you're doing okay up there. Um, with those fires, it's, it's really scary. So hopefully you're okay. Some other words that are important to know uh, when you talk about Italian wines is classico. So as you can expect, it translates to classic. Uh, all of you all know more Italian than you thought. And this is really where the tradition of a certain wine took off. And, and the obvious example for this would be maybe Chianti Classico, uh, where we're talking about the oldest named winery, uh, wine region of Italy, if not the world, Chianti, that goes back to the 1400s. Where did that tradition start? Where's the heart and center of it? Is it necessarily the best? No, but it's an indicator, again, of quality. Another good example would be um, Valpolicella Classico or Soave Classico. Certain areas that had the tradition of doing this wine and had it down maybe sooner than anywhere else. So there's a good chance the quality is better. Other important word to know is Iserva, which is like reserve. And you, you compare that to other countries in the world that make wine, say, for example, in, in some parts of South America or in California, where it's a fairly non-restricted term. You can put reserva on pretty much whatever you want. Or in Spain, where it is very specifically a marker of quality for specific wines. In Italy, it just means that it's been aged longer and usually one year longer uh, than the non reserva version of that wine. But in certain cases, it's more like, uh, for example, in Barolo, uh, the minimum aging for a Barolo is 38 months, but for a, for a Riserva, it's actually 50 months. So 60 months, sorry. So five years as opposed to three years. I shouldn't do it in months. I should keep it simple. So five years of aging as opposed to three years. So an extra two years of aging before you can put Riserva on the label. So even that is controlled. And the idea is that we want to be able to have this confidence, this reasoning, this organization behind the word. So everything has to mean something. That's why we have so much to look at in Italy. And I'm sorry, you haven't been able to go visit the uh, uh, wine country in Texas. There's some really good wines being made in Texas right now. Um, and with now the appropriate grapes, because sometimes we fall in love with grapes and want them to do well everywhere. But just like we see in Italy is the same for everywhere else in the world. Certain grapes really make a lot of sense in certain climates and soil types. So once that gets dialed in and the benefit that Italians have had has been doing this for thousands of years compared to, you know, a couple hundred years, the most in most other places in the, the new world. Uh, we have that benefit of the longevity of knowledge and what hit or miss, you know, what works, what doesn't. Um, but yeah, some great wine country uh, wines in, in Texas. So hopefully you get a chance to, to do that soon. Uh, but yeah, glad you've been able to go to, to oh yeah, you haven't been able to go lately. That's true. Uh, yeah. So some tasting rooms have opened up in California um, safely. We just talked to, to um Kip earlier this last month uh, over at Beckman and, and some other wineries in California been able to open some haven't with restricted terms. So I'm sad to hear in Texas, uh, looks like that maybe has not been the case, but I'm glad you've been able to enjoy them for years. Yeah, some great wines in Texas. Another um, important word to know is frizzante. Now frizzante just means fizzy. And the most ex obvious example for me being in uh, spending a lot of time in Piemonte is Moscato di Asti. So when you have a Moscato di Asti DOCG, you actually have specific requirements about how fizzy that wine has to be. So it can't be not fizzy at all, has to have like three quarters of an atmosphere pressure at least to a little bit more, but it can't have too much. So for example, once you get beyond two bars, three atmospheres of pressure, which are almost the same uh, quantity, two uh, atmospheres and, and bars, then it, it, you're, you're no longer allowed to be called the Moscato di Asti. Then you're really thinking about more Asti, which is separate DOCG, well, different parts of a DOCG, uh, which have its own separate requirements of the provenance of the grapes and how it's done. So frizzante means fizzy, and that's a technical term in Italy. Spumante, on the other hand, is now when you go beyond uh, three at least, you know, two and a half, really uh, three plus atmospheres of pressure, which is a true sparkling wine of Italy, whether it be a tank method, like a lot of proseccos are done, 
uh, or whether it be bottle fermented like Francia Corta or some Trentino docks or some other sparkling wines in different parts of Italy. So a very specific technical term. And the last one I would probably say, you know, usually appears in the bottle. It might not, but a good term to know from Italy is passito. Now, passito just means dried out. Oftentimes in other parts of the world, that's specifically exclusive to sweet wines and oftentimes is as well in Italy because basically what you're doing, whether it be using noble rot, uh, a mold to get uh, extract water uh, from the grape. So the density, the change of how much sugar and different aromatic, aromatic compounds, the density and the concentration is richer in the final grapes or whether it be ice fine, whether the frost itself helps extract some of the water uh, in the grape, or whether it be um, just dried out grapes like they do in Northern Italy and other parts of Italy, the level of sugar to water in the wine is a lot higher. So oftentimes you end up with a sweet wine at the end because the level of sugar is well above what the yeast can convert to alcohol or what you'd want to have in alcohol because yeast operate in a certain comfort level of alcohol. And when it gets too high, uh, the yeast will die off depending on the strain of yeast. So oftentimes you get the sweet wine, but it can also be used as a technique in uh, for dry wines where you're just upping the level of alcohol. So for we'll get into in a little bit, for example, in Northern Italy in um, the Veneto, it's a fairly cool area and there aren't as many tannic rich, rich grapes like there are in, in Piemonte. So the ancient technique of drying out the grapes to bring out more alcohol because there's more sugar that can be converted to alcohol as well as tannin and richness uh, is useful for a dry wine as well. So those that's kind of the discussion uh, about where we are in Italy. And I've got a couple of examples to kind of make sense of it all. And so for those of you that are just following right now, just to really quickly go over it, uh, basically what we're talking about is Italy has so many rules and so many unique wines, but that's the fun part. Because we have so much rich biodiversity that can breed this complexity, this array that we have in Italy that's unmatched anywhere else in the world, there are so many more opportunities to fall in love with so many different wines. And this presentation was to kind of explain why Italy has so much more than so many other countries. And whether that's a good thing, in my estimation, or overwhelming for others, but because of the unique geology, complexity, the climate, the culture, the history, everything combines plus more to create all these opportunities for this explosion of evolution of different types of grapes in Italy. And Italians have definitely uh, taken advantage of that to be able to create and craft so many different wines. And so just to kind of zoom in on a couple of different wines to kind of make sense of it all. So for example, uh, we talk about Chianti. So Chianti, I mentioned before, is this very large region now. Um, it became a very commercial wine because it was so good. And so the area of Chianti expanded well beyond the limits that were originally set in the 1400s, 1500s, 1600s. So you have all these wines that have a lot of things in common. They're from the same general area of central western uh, Toscana, Tuscany. They all majorly use Sangiovese grape as the base. There have been some changes recently to, well, last 20 years uh, in Chianti where it started out potentially as a blend of two red grapes and two white grapes. Now it's predominantly a red grape dominated uh, wine with Sangiovese becoming much more important uh, as the techniques to do Sangiovese have changed. But typically, Chianti share something in the organolytical qualities of being having these south dark, south, south sour, dark cherry notes, but at the same time, some nice levels of elegance and smoothness and some richness and complexity. Um, you know, at the very basic level, Chianti's on average are, are, are quite nice that way. Oh, and here. Thank goodness I listed some dates, so I didn't forget. But basically, yeah, the 1400s is where this area kind of became known as a wine producing region of the world. And 1716 is when they really started to define a lot of the different sub areas of Chianti um, in the 1930s, um, really nailing down a lot of those sub areas. So for example, in Chianti, it's not just one monolith of wine. We have several different sub zones. There's the classical zone, 
which like we talked about is where most likely the idea, the concept of Chianti started. In fact, uh, a producer uh, named Matze has been active there since 1436, I believe, no, 1432, 1436. So one of the very first producers of Chianti, in fact, they were the first ones to actually write the word Chianti on a document. And they've been active there for 26 generations and they're in Chianti Classico, as well as uh, Cecchi as well, another great producer. So other ones are Colli Aretini, Colli Fiorentini, Colline Pisane, Colli Senesi, Montalbano, Montespertoli, and Ruffina. Now, for all those that have Colli or Colline in the name, that means hill. And so basically, you're thinking about these clustering of hills in different parts of the larger Chianti zone where these wines are consistently similar in certain ways and unique in others. In fact, if you were to look at some of the laws, the Giuplinare for these sub areas, they all vary a little bit because the soil is a little bit different, because the climate's a little bit different, because the style is a little bit different. And so the levels of alcohol and the blend of grapes varies a little bit from area to area. And once again, is it really important for you to memorize the unique laws of each sub area? I mean, you could, but really what's more important is understanding why there's a difference. What's the soil like a little bit? What's the influence of the ocean? How does that translate into a law that then takes that into account? To me, that's more important. And so being able to try the different wines and seeing where those differences lies, will then, if you have the sheet in front of you with the differences, you go, ah, I see now why the alcohol level is required to be higher here, why this is supposed to be different. Other good things to know about Chianti is that Chianti Classico Reserva is 24 months. So in the Chianti Classico area, Reserva means 24 months. It's a little bit different from other areas. And another new thing you may have noticed is uh, Chianti Classico Gran Selezione. So this is a fairly new concept where the best wineries put forth their best single vineyard wines as the best selection of themselves as representative of the top wines from Chianti. Good thing to note also is that there is such a thing as Chianti Reserva that can be a good wine, but it's not equivalent to Chianti Classico Reserva because the aging requirements are different. And obviously the zones of production are much larger in Chianti, writ large, as opposed to a sub area like Chianti Classico. And I should also note that this next bit is gonna be incredibly controversial. The person that told me this, my instructor for this, mentioned it was gonna be incredibly controversial. And I agreed with him that it was incredibly controversial, but I could see where he was going with this. And I think it, it speaks to the point of this presentation. When people think about Chianti, when they think about Brunello, when they think about Vino Nobile di Montepulciano, Suvereto, Morellino di Scanzano, those are unique, beautiful, fantastic wines in their own right. Also, they could be considered different versions of Chianti. Because if you think of what Chianti really is, mostly Sangiovese, adapted to in concert with or uniquely by itself to the soil and where it's done, there are some differences that become similar nearby and more markedly different in different areas. But all those wines that I mentioned are Sangiovese dominated from this part of Toscana, this part of Italy. So it's sometimes taking a step back makes you realize that it doesn't take away from the wines, that they are similar in recipe, but that they really speak so truly to the unique areas and styles of production that they are legitimately distinct wines. And I think that's really cool. Another great example of specifics of a wine growing region is in Valpolicella, which literally means the valley of many cellars, Valpolicella. It's, uh, it's based on Greek because there are so many beautiful cellars that have so much history back then, uh, that, that have a long history in that area. And there's a couple of different wines. There's a, a trio of wines that uh, are very famous we talked about together. And this talks about the Pasito that I mentioned earlier. So all three of these wines are going to share the same grapes. It's going to be Corvina and or Corvinone, Rondinella, and maybe some other grapes like Molinara, which has fallen out of fashion quite a bit. But typical grapes from that area allowed in this Disciplinare. And these wines are going to be Amarone della Valpolicella, Valpolicella, 
and either ripasso or doppia fermentazione, uh, wine in between. Because what you have in the, this part of the Veneto, near Vero north of Verona, is a fairly cool climate with not many grapes, like I mentioned, that have this level of tannic structure, except for like Oseleta, which is not a very largely produced grape. And so you have these grapes that have a lot of beauty to them. And so to make a wine that is very drinkable and enjoyable during the summer in, say, Verona, there's a Valpolicella, Classico, even better, DOC. It's fairly light-bodied, has a nice acidity to it. It's fresh, uh, has some tannin, but not a whole bunch. It's just a very pleasant wine that matches very easily with first courses. But it's difficult to make that wine very powerful. So one of the brilliant ideas that is actually centuries old is to dry out the grapes, like they do have the tradition to make a sweet wine, like a risciotto in the area, but to use that technique to make a dry wine that has a higher level of alcohol and a more concentrated flavor and level of tannin. And so in uh, Valporicella, they'll actually have the system of laying out grapes on these trays uh, or larger commercial wineries will use other things, but uh, say for example, Mazi has these, uh, uh, I can't think of the word in English, but these mats, these drying mats, and these unique winds that come through uh, the area that'll keep the grapes from molding, very important. So they keep this fresh air current going around the grapes, so the grapes resonate, they become pasito, concentrating everything. And then those grapes are crushed into made into wine, you have this bold, beautiful, brooding, but very aromatic wine Amarone, which is now a completely different beast than Valpolicella Classico. It's now more of a winter wine. It's now for second courses, meat courses, or uh, aged cheese courses. Same grapes, just the technique's a little bit different. And then, of course, there was a need for an eater meter wine because you have your first course wine, you have your second course wine, but maybe you have a you know another course in between. And so a marrying of the two wines has been in fashion for a very long time. And, and uh, Mazi actually had the um, trademark for the Ripasso system where you basically, and, and this is very much uh, basic understanding level generalizing, but you combine the juice from Valporicella with the leftover organic particles of Amarone production to, so that the liquid absorbs some of the intensity of Amarone. Very basic way of talking about it. And of course, now some wineries like Mazi have gone you know, to a completely different level where now they're fermenting the wine twice so that it really um, wraps together these two wines so you have a, a very nice in-between wine. So their Campio Fiorin is a good example of that, especially the Barolo, the Campo Fiorin, uh, with some Mozoleta. Another great example, you know, we usually talk about Lambrusco in the, the United States uh, and other countries as this fairly enjoyable, sweet style of wine. And that is, there is a lot of room and a lot of necessity for a wine like that, especially if you're doing spicy foods, uh, like in Mexico or in other areas, or if it's really hot and you want something that's extra refreshing, a little bit of sweetness that's chilled down is just amazing. In Italy, it's typically enjoyed a little bit drier, and it's actually quite a bit of a serious category. In fact, now some Lambruscos are getting Trebicchieri and are really considered some of the top wines uh, of Italy as well and representative because not only do you have just as you don't once again have a monolith of Lambrusco. It's not just the whole Emilia Romagna region that makes this grape and makes this sweet Lambrusco style, but you have sub areas and you have a grape that has this unique ability to do well on sandy soils as well as in sub types uh, genetic clones of Lambrusco to do well on more gravelly or silt or clay. So you can actually draw quite a bit of distinction amongst what most people think is a fairly simple wine like Lambrusco. And so you can go from sweet, absolutely, to very dry, a bone dry for some Lambruscos. And some examples of great sub areas or the, the examples of sub areas of Lambrusco are the ones listed here. Lambrusco di Sorbara, DOC. Lambrusco Grasparossa di Castelvetro, DOC. Lambrusco Mantovano, DOC, e Lambrusco Salamino di Santa Croce. That just slides off the tongue like nobody's business. Love Italian, DOC. So even, you know, some of the wines that maybe we don't take as seriously as Lambrusco, we can in Italy. Very much the same thing with Prosecco. 
you know, the, the amount of Prosecco along with Pinot Grigio has changed the dynamic of production in Italy so much that we've actually gone from a country that is do that was dominated by red wine production to now it's majority white wine production because of the interest, the desire for Prosecco and Pinot Grigio and other whites of Italy. And there's, Italy has so many beautiful whites, but these two obviously drive the sales and the production. And at the very basic level, yeah, Glera uh, is the grape now that makes Prosecco. That's Italy decided that it was very important and it was smart to protect the word Prosecco because Prosecco was being made everywhere. Uh, it still actually is in, in Brazil as Prosecco. Um, but it really needed to be Italian. And so you start thinking about Prosecco a little bit and you realize there's a level of complexity that goes well beyond what most people uh, here, unless they've studied it, expect from Prosecco. You look at different, there's, Prosecco starts at the DOC level, and then it can be actually flat. Uh, it can be unfiltered, col fondo. It can be lightly sparkling, frizzante, uh, which is really popular in Germany. Or it can be full on spumante, which is what most of us have experienced with Prosecco. But you can go beyond quite a bit. There's actually a, a DOCG uh, Prosecco, more than one. There's Conigliano Vado uh Prosecco. There's uh, Proseccos that span two different regions, Friuli and uh, 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 Veneto. There's uh, sub areas that are near uh, where the river path is, the Rive, there's sub areas. There's so many different styles of Prosecco. And so in fact, for those that are in the sales of Prosecco, you'll see is Prosecco houses where you, if you're new to Prosecco, you might just be going straight to the eight, $10 wholesale Prosecco. Then you see this portfolio of different Proseccos that producers offer. And uh, you quickly, hopefully, realize that the level of intensity, the aromatics, can be uh, quite interesting in just a wine like Prosecco. And of course, now we get to Barolo. And as a microcosm of why all this really makes sense, I'm going to go a little bit deeper in Barolo. This is now towards the end. I, I have no idea what time it is. It is 6.17, so I've been going on for an hour. So I'll try to keep this brief because I can talk about Barolo for over an hour, and I have on these. But I think it's a great way to conceptualize where if you are excited about this, how deep you can go and how rewarding Italy is beyond any other country in this respect, because there's so many systems in place that once you acquire a different notch or nugget of knowledge, you can keep digging and digging and digging and you get more and back and you start to understand why there's so many different rules. And you can combine all this together. So for example, Barolo is part of this large region called Piemonte that we saw that map earlier. Barolo comes from a sub area called the Lange, uh, which are these very rapid succession hills that are near the Tanaro River in Piemonte, in the southeast of Piemonte. Then you can look at the different towns. So you look at the Nebbiolo, it's like a Lange Nebbiolo, which is different from a Barolo in Barbaresco. It's not a baby Barolo, it's not a baby Barbaresco, at least not in my mind. It's just a grape Nebbiolo done in the area of the Lange, potentially in Barolo or Barbaresco, but it's not necessarily meant to be a juvenile form of either one. It's just a more accessible form because it's not aged as long. It's not required to be aged as long, in my mind. Or maybe the vines are a little bit younger. Then you have Barbaresco and Barolo, and I'll, I'll show uh, a slide about how it is incredible that you have two different DOCG wines that are so close together, kind of like Gatinara and Geme, where it's made from the same grape, in two towns that are, you know, less than 10 miles apart, but why? And, you know, I've done a talk about that as well. And then you can dig deeper and talk about the, the fairly new since 2012 MGAs, Mencione Geografiche Aggiuntive, or the cruise of Barolo, and why it really makes sense to have that. So, for example, here's the slide I was telling you about between Barolo and Barbaresco. It's about 15 kilometers as the crow flies between the two villages. And... There are things in common between the two, like you would expect. They both use Nebbiolo. They almost assuredly use the same clones of Nebbiolo. The soil is similar in Barbaresco uh, to some parts of Barolo. The wine aging, they're both aged for a while, but longer in Barolo. Barolo is a little bit larger of an area. The altitudes are about the same, but the wines are different. And it's because these small little differences on a grape that's very sensitive to small change, and we'll see that to the nth degree, can really be considered completely different wines between Barbaresco and Barolo. In fact, when you think about 
comparing the wines, you're not necessarily thinking about the same things because Barolo, depending on where it's in Barolo also, but Barolo sometimes has a level of tannin that's a little bit higher. The aging makes the wine a little bit darker and deeper and denser and, and more leaning towards the more of the secondary and tertiary characteristics compared to Barbaresco, which is usually aged a little bit less. So you get more of the fruit and flowers, you know, in, in, in the world of, of tar and roses of Barolo and Barbaresco. But there are unique differences that are enough that create completely different wines. And this is where Italian wines to me get really exciting because we have so many different grapes, but then you take those grapes and you play with them and you can see how much you can get and how much completely different things you can get, wines, things from the same grape. So here, oh, there it is. Um, so here in one page is some of the everything we've talked about. You know, if you look at the top series of pictures, there's that picture again of Piemonte with all the DOCs and DOCGs, and you focus down into Barolo, which is made up of these nine villages, five majority villages, and then four other villages that are very make very good Barolo as well. And then you go look at this new reality of the MGAs that are sub areas, where there's 181 sub areas in this very tiny area. So we're talking about I don't know what is it, 40 square kilometers? That is the entirety of Barolo production. 10 million bottles sounds like a lot but it's you know we think about how many people in the world might want a bottle of bottle there's not that much to go around and if you it's maybe a little hard to see i don't know with this new router if you can see the level of detail but the topology the 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 different soil types you can't see in this map but you'll they'll see that once you study this there's three major soil types in barolo but it's actually broken up in sub areas and so there's 11 unique soil types in the barolo area and so you start to understand just based on soil and the grape. So on the left there, that's the Nebbiolo grape and the different earth that you find different parts. So that's a, a, a stone from Boscareto in Seralunga, how it's different, how it looks different, how it smells different. And some people have done it, taste different, uh, the earth in different parts of Barolo, which make completely different wines. And once again, that's subjective. So is, it a, is one Barolo a completely different wine from another Barolo? You know, that depends on your level of experience. Because if you have never tried Barolo before and you should to try two different bottles, you'll find a lot of common between the two. There'll be a lot of astringency and you'll notice a lot of similarity between the aromatics and the expression and the power. But once you're able to pick apart the differences, you can really appreciate that this sub area makes unique aromatics compared to this other sub area and flavor and color and longevity. And they have things that make sense. You think about the history as well of this area. You know, you put this one page could be an hour discussion of what makes Barolo so unique. And, and that to me is hand in hand with the biodiversity of Italy, what makes Italy so much fun. There's so much opportunity to learn so much more. And the rules, whether you chafe against them or not, can give you some indications as far as the quality and the rationale of why those rules are there. So the rules themselves, important. But the why for the rules, that is understanding Italian wines. And so, for example, if we do a zoom in of two different wines from Batosciolo, Bricolina on the top here, Boscareto. <coughs> I have no idea how to turn off my mic while I sneeze. I apologize. Bricolina and Boscareto, if you have a really good arm, I'm sure you could throw a stone from one to the other. They're both in the same village, Seralunga. But the hills are a little bit different and the winds are different in one vineyard to another. So Boscareto is actually a little bit higher. If you look there, it tops out at 400 meters above sea level, a little bit higher than 400 meters, 420, compared to Baricolina, which is a little bit less high. And the planting of the vines are a little bit more on the top of the hill, hence Barico, compared to Boscareto, which is a little bit steeper and graded and southern facing of a vineyard. So a lot of times these winds will come up uniquely from the south to the going to the northwest. And so Boscareto Vineyard will actually block some of the winds that go to Bricolina. And therefore, when you combine all of this, it starts to make sense why Batasciolo ages their Bricolina more in these smaller barrels because the level of intensity in tannins, also because of the soil type, is most more likely creates a Nebbiolo grape that's richer in tannin than say even Boscareto, which is the exact same grape, same clones, fairly similar soil type, 
with some unique differences in the soil and winds and, and a little bit the climate. And so they do this in a larger barrel. So that's for me, once again, the beauty of a timeline, being able to go deeper and deeper and deeper and understand the why behind it. Because for me, it gets boring studying just the what, but how that translates is really the exciting thing, the why behind. Why do I say that Italy is the number one wine country in the world? Because of this richness of, of complexity and how you have infinite, well, very large opportunities to, to fall in love with so many different wines of Italy. And of course, once we can again, traveling there is the best way. So this is a shot of a, a hotel uh, from the Dogliani family in uh, Piemonte. Uh, so you can really understand even better why Italy is so exciting because hopefully you either travel to Italy or you've planned to travel to Italy and you know the joy that people come back from Italy with connecting also with the food and wine and again why that's so exciting. So that's that that's the presentation uh, I'm gonna stop sharing now see if there are any other questions that I have for you so I apologize about the technical difficulties in the beginning that was a new style of presentation uh, for me uh, with some new technology and some new hardware. So um, hopefully got a little bit better towards the end. Uh, let me see if there's any other questions I have you have for me. Otherwise, uh, uh, I, I want to mention now, I should have mentioned before, that I'm going to finish my pivot to Italy. I'm very excited. Uh, so this, this month, I talked to uh, Marco, who uh, uh, went back home to Italy uh, to start a new project there um, in uh, near Rome, in Lazio. Uh, Marco Maestoso, I talked to Petra, who is uh, temporarily left San Diego to go travel in Italy uh, for the summer and uh, get closer connected to some vineyard, uh, wine producers and uh, further her wine studies. So we saw a little bit about what's going on in Italy uh, under the new changes in COVID and what people's thoughts were on how that's gonna have lasting or non-lasting effects on how we enjoy wine, where we enjoy wine, how we talk about wine, how we, um, follow the logistics of wine production to being able to enjoy it at home or somewhere else. Uh, we talked about that a little bit. And then today was a discussion on Italy itself, uh, a pay on to my, my homeland, um, which like everybody I've talked to so far uh, has been one foot in Italy, one foot in San Diego. Um, and then next week I'm going to, uh, is going to be the headliner. I'm going to be talking to Fiorenzo Dogliani, uh, the, proprietor, the, the managing director of Batasciolo uh, from the Dogliani family, and uh, Paola Marai, a brand ambassador, uh, central brand ambassador for, for Batasciolo. So we should be talking to them. Uh, last I heard, we were going to be talking next week on Thursday in the morning at 9 a.m. Uh, that has to be confirmed, but that'll be kind of the, the uh, exciting conclusion of our time in Italy. And then after that, um, I'll probably announce it next time, but I already have plans for next month as well to keep this going on its own thing. Uh, so a question from Mark in Texas, who has not been to a winery in Texas in a while, but has enjoyed going there and has some good Italian wine knowledge. So let's see here. Let me bring it to the screen so I can answer it in real time. Boom, technology. You referenced the variety among Barolos. Did Barbaresco experience a similar diversification in the 70s and 80s, or did the Barolo Wars pertain to Barolos? That's a very deep, good question about Barbaresco and Barolo. And uh, the answer is not necessarily linear. So there are some things that happen first in Barolo, some things that happen first in Barbaresco. Since Barbaresco is a smaller area that has a longer history of cooperation, maybe is the right word, uh, between uh, producers like, say, Produtori del Barbaresco, uh, which is uh, 15, 15 different producers that uh, joined together to make one unique wine in, in Barbaresco compared to Barolo, which um, more traditionally had a um, cooperative, uh, a less uh, intimate cooperative or a relationship between growers and uh, bottlers, uh, which transitioned to more individual, unique grower, uh, bottler. So that now we have almost 400 different Barolo producers in this larger area that has this longer history of making their own unique bottlings. So, um, there, it probably could be said that there were some unique moment, moments in Barolo that happened first, uh, where the Barolo Wars you're referencing were in the 1980s, 1970s, 1980s, where there was this idea where for some producers, maybe the austerity of Barolo, the necessity to age your wines so that they could be enjoyed, sometimes for some people 
it was something that they were sad that they were not able to enjoy within their lifetime because it's some bottles just take so long, uh, especially in the traditional style to be made that maybe they could with modern techniques, they could be in, you know, modern 1980s techniques could be enjoyed sooner. And also so that you could avoid certain negative effects, like losing some of the aromatics that sometimes fade along with color with time with a wine, like a, a Barolo. So there were maybe more unique personalities in Barolo. Uh, but also, you know, we can't forget probably the most, um, I, what's the word, uh, iconic smashing uh, producers in the region like uh, Angelo Gaia that, you know, uh, made his dad mad by planting grapes that were not traditional to the region and decided that he could make wines that were maybe even better. De Barolo uh, in the area of Barbaresco. And of course, he's, he's one of the few that are active in Barolo and Barbaresco. So um, yes and no. Um, but then again, uh, if we talk about sub-sub areas, there's a lot of evidence that that happened in Barbaresco even before. Um, so even though there were people that wrote treatises about the unique sub-areas in Barolo back in the 1700s, it became more of a classified reality in Barbaresco slightly before even in Barolo, uh, because even though Barolo and Barbaresco are both upgraded to DOC and then DOC chief status at the same time, they still had this uniqueness of character and this uniqueness of wine being separate wines where there were enough differentiation between the two styles of wine. That's why uh, there is this unique DOCG aspect to them being so close to an area together, yet unique wines. But of course, we have to remember that up until the 1900s, it took a while to get from Barolo to Barbaresco. So um, it's close to us now to get from Barolo to Barbaresco, but it was far apart uh, then that you could really make a more pronounced differentiation uh, in the origin of Barolo and Barbaresco. Now, if two wine regions were uh, nascent at the same time, only 15 minutes away from each other, there probably wouldn't be uh, an insular difference between the two, but it was probably compounded by the physical and time distance between the two regions um, since they're so old of, of wine growing regions. That's an incredibly long-winded answer to your question. Uh, I don't know if that answered your question to, to satisfaction. Um, so feel free to have a follow-up question after that, uh, if that wasn't to, to your satisfaction. But that was a great uh, in-depth question to ask. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate that. Any other questions I can answer for anybody? Hopefully, um, this wasn't a heavy lecturette. Hopefully, you, uh, hopefully the takeaway, my, my intention that your takeaway for this was that Italian wines are exciting. Um, you shouldn't get comfortable with Italian wines once you found that one, two, you know, you fell in love with Pinot Grigio, great. There's some great Pinot Grigios in Italy, but there's so many beautiful white wines in Italy. Um, cool, you fell in love with Sangiovese, great grape, makes some of the Italy's best wines, but there's so many different regions of Italy, so many different grapes, and it's so rewarding, even if it takes some attention, it requires you to pay attention, that hopefully it's rewarding, and that's where I get excited. So unless there's any other questions, um, I will take any other questions uh, after the show because now we're getting to the hour 30 mark. Um, and so this is becoming a lot of me talking to myself, uh, which was the origin, the origin of this, uh, this video. But yeah, so I'll answer any other questions in the comments.